Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get started on section 6.16.3, uh, germination. But the first thing we need to cover are the adaptations for pollination, so germination can ultimately occur. So when we talk about the differences in pollination and germination in flowers, pollination is specifically when the pollen is transferred from the male flower to the female portion of the flower. Um, so the male uh, portion of the flower, that stamen that has the anther and the filament, will have pollen grains on it that need to make their way in some form, either by insect or by wind, to the stigma, which is the female portion of the flower that leads down into the ovary, where we have the ovule that's waiting for the pollen grain to make its way to it. So fertilization or germination can occur. Germination is the phrase that we use in plants, okay? So <clears throat> insect pollinated flowers are adapted specifically for this to occur and the adaptations would be things like with our petals they are large and brightly colored to attract insects um, they have scent and nectar that entices insects to be attracted to them the number of pollen grains are fairly moderate um, because insects can transfer those pollen grains with a higher rate of success if there are more of them. Um, your pollen grains on an insect pollinated type flower would be larger and stickier or spiky, maybe the way it's depicted in an image, um, ultimately to stick to insects and be carried by them. And then the anthers inside of the flower, they're very stiff and firmly attached so they can brush against um, insects. So this would be your anther right here that I'm circling with the mouse. And then the stigma. The stigma is going to be inside the flower, very sticky, so that pollen grains can stick to it when an insect brushes past it. And the stigma is right here. Okay, now we can also look at the, um, the adaptations for wind pollinated plants. So if it's a plant that is typically wind pollinated, those petals are actually going to be smaller and dull and often green or brown in color because they're not needing to attract those insects. For their scent and nectar, it's absent. They don't need it. They don't need to waste their energy to produce it because they're not, again, not attracting insects. For the number of pollen grains, though, very, very, very large. So large amounts of those pollen grains um, <clears throat> to better the chance of success with pollination occurring. Their pollen grains are then going to be smooth and small and very, very light, so they can be blown by the wind. And then for their anthers, those anthers are going to be outside of the flower, so they can swing loosely on long filaments to release pollen grains easily. And then their stigma is also going to be outside of the flower and very feathery to catch any drifting pollen grains in the wind. Okay, um, moving on. I'll give you again those all each of those tables are going to be in their notes for you but just moving on this would be an image of pollen grains so you can see um, which pollen grains are involved in insect pollination it would definitely be the ones that look more um, sticky or like they have extensions coming out of them so definitely just one only okay and that has a test question that's fairly common so it's a great one to pause and look at um we can also look at self and cross pollination, um, just dealing with um, pollen from one plant going to another. And, you know, this is in, in real life circumstances. This is something I have to watch out with, with the way that I grow my peppers at home. I grow jalapeno peppers and bell peppers. And um, just with pollinating insects, my bell peppers can end up spicy like my jalapenos through cross-pollination. So you're you're told as a gardener to try to grow those um, apart from one another, even though they're in similar families. And then we have fertilization. Um, fertilization, which uh, is where we're going to have the pollen that's going to make its way from the male um, from the male uh, anther to the female stigma and then it'll get down into the tube as it grows down the style towards the ovary into that ovule area and then once it's fertilized it forms the zygote and that zygote forms into a seed so the seed forms in that ovule so you can see pollen the pollen tubule so it makes its way to the stigma down into the ovary where the ovule is waiting so when fertilization occurs um, or germination occurs, 
we have that forming into a seed. And then we can move on to the factors that affect germination. So germination is the start of the growth of that seed. So once pollen meets ovary, the zygote is formed. Um, germination is that result. And three factors affect it, water, oxygen, and warmth. So water allows the seed to swell up and the enzymes in the embryo to start working so that growth can occur. So of course, water is very important to plants, as well as oxygen to give them that energy can be released for germination and then warmth. Germination improves as temperature rises and as the reaction which will take place are controlled by those enzymes that are controlled by temperature. So when um, it's kind of the, the idea of think about springtime when it starts to warm up outside, you see everything in bloom. It's the same concepts because our earth is warming up, the temperature is rising, there's more reaction occurring for germination and for growth. Um, and then ultimately, you are going to have several videos that help you um, investigate germination. So some of these you can scroll through and pause um, and look at just the different conditions that are going to be helpful for germination. And there's a few test questions on that. But again, those will be in some of our Ed puzzles this week that we do. And then we move on to human reproduction. So this pretty much wraps it up for reproduction in plants. So go on, head on over to your notes, get any, get all of those written down. Um, you'll have a CFU, Ed Puzzle, and then your assignment for the day. Good job, guys.